Today, I'm going to discuss the work of two giants of Japanese cinema, Ozu Yasujiro and Kurosawa Akira. Both are acclaimed masters of film, and their work regularly appears on top 10 lists of greatest films ever made. But instead of a more standard overview of Ozu and Kurosawa, we're going to explore them in the context of the themes we've been exploring throughout this course, the relationship between globalization and Japanese culture. So while we'll see that both directors are distinctly Japanese, we'll also see that they are deeply connected to world cinema, in particular to American film. But since this is a course on Japanese culture, I'll refer to these directors Japanese style, family name first. So it's Kurosawa Akira, not Akira Kurosawa, and Ozu Yasujiro, not Yasujiro Ozu. So first, let's look at Ozu, and we'll focus on his 1953 film, Tokyo Story. It's an Ozu masterpiece, but it was inspired by a 1937 American film, Make Way for Tomorrow, directed by Leo McCary. Now the two films are strikingly similar, but the American film has an American sense of right and wrong, a biblical moral sense, while Ozu's version has a more Buddhist sensibility. Intriguingly, McCary's film is now described as a forgotten Hollywood masterpiece, and I suspect that many people today watch Make Way for Tomorrow because they've heard or read that it inspired the Ozu film. Now, Make Way for Tomorrow is a brutally unsentimental movie. It takes a cold, unflinching look at how American families dealt with aging and economic hardship. So here's the rough plot. Barkley and Lucy, an elderly couple, are losing their home to foreclosure. And they ask their five adult children for help, but only two are willing to assist them. And unfortunately, neither has enough space for both parents. So Barkley and Lucy are separated. Barkley goes to live with his daughter, Cora, and Lucy goes to live with her son, George. Now at heart, this is a morality play about young people not caring enough about their parents. And McCary is not subtle about this. He opens the movie by showing the text of the biblical commandment, honor thy father and mother. And the film is pretty rough on the kids. They're portrayed as selfish, manipulative, and vain. Now, as I said, George takes in his mother, but there's no extra bedroom. So mother Lucy has to share a room with her teenage granddaughter. And the granddaughter loves her grandmother, but she stops bringing her friends home and she starts staying out late. And George's wife says, this has got to stop or our daughter will develop a reputation. And George is stuck. He has to choose between his mother on the one side and his wife and daughter on the other. And he chooses his wife and daughter. Now, McCary seems pretty clear that George is making the wrong choice. But George is somewhat redeemed because at least he's pained by the decision. His siblings seem too selfish to even care. Now, Ozu never saw Make Way for Tomorrow, but it was a favorite film of his longtime screenwriter, Noda Kogo. And Kogo recommended that Ozu make the film. And the result is that some characters are almost identical in the two films. But Tokyo Story is also a distinctively Ozu film. Instead of a narrative illustrating a biblical commandment, we get a quiet and complex rumination on the nature of family. And that's the signature feature of an Ozu film. In Ozu's version, the elderly couple are husband Shukichi and wife Tomi. They live in the town of Onomichi near Hiroshima 
with their youngest daughter, Kyoko. And they're going to Tokyo to visit their son, their daughter, and their daughter-in-law. The daughter-in-law lost her husband in the war. They arrive in Tokyo, where they are utterly neglected by their children. Koichi, the son, is roughly parallel to George in the American film. And he seems to be well-intentioned, but he neglects his parents just the same. And daughter Shige, she's closely parallel to Cora, one of the rotten daughters in the McCary film. The striking difference between the two films is the addition of the seemingly, seemingly wonderful daughter-in-law Noriko. She's widowed, she's the poorest of the children, she lives in a tiny apartment, but she takes time off from work to take her late husband's parents around sightseeing. Ozu repeats the device of separating the aging parents. Tomi spends one night with the gentle Noriko, while Father Shukichi is with Shige, who is openly disgusted by her own father. As in the McCary film, the elderly parents talk about their disappointment with their children. And they wonder whether their children's behavior reflects on their upbringing. Did we raise our own children to be so selfish? But soon, the visit in Tokyo is over, and it's time to go back to Onomichi. Now, it's 1953, more than 20 years before bullet train service to Hiroshima. So it's a long journey back. And Grandmother Tomi falls desperately ill during the journey home. She makes it back to Onomichi, but she lapses into a coma. The children head to Onomichi, and they gather at her deathbed. They stay for the funeral, but after a distinctly unemotional funeral, they head back to Tokyo. So as with the McCary film, overall, these adult children are a pretty lame bunch. But Ozu's film is vastly more complex than McCary's. And while much of that depth is developed in fragments of dialogue throughout the film, it all comes together towards the end, and especially in the last few scenes. For example, Kyoko, the youngest daughter, who will now be living just with her widowed father. She's furious with her sister Shige. Shige has just grabbed some of their deceased mother's things, and Kyoko is disgusted. And Kyoko's right to be disgusted. Shiga is selfish and awful. But Ozu never makes it so simple. Because we've learned through bits of dialogue throughout the film that Father Shukichi was once a heavy drinker. And a mean drunk. And he only stopped drinking when Kyoko was born. So Kyoko grew up with a sober and loving father. But Shige... Not so much. And when Shige wanted to throw her own father out of the house back in Tokyo, well, he had come home drunk, cheerfully drunk, but drunk, and after he'd promised not to drink anymore. So Shige is as rotten as Cora, but Ozu denies us Makeri's stark biblical clarity. Shige is being a lousy daughter, but her dad was a lousy father. And the good daughter-in-law, Noriko, she's even more complex. Near the end of the film, Shukichi thanks her for her kindness. She has been better to him than his own children by blood. But Noriko vehemently denies this. I'm not good, she insists. I'm sneaky. I'm deceptive. And when Shukichi urges her to remarry, Noriko breaks down crying. I'm so lonely, she cries, but there's no future for me. So she's the ideal daughter-in-law on the surface, but she's devastatingly lonely. And her virtue seems to stem from a deep trauma. And here too, scattered throughout the film, are hints that Shukichi's son, Noriko's husband, was also a heavy drinker and also a mean drunk and that Noriko's marriage was not entirely happy, and that maybe she's a good daughter-in-law 
only because she's too scarred by her first marriage to seek another partner and move on with her own life. So once again, Ozu won't give us Makari's clarity. Noriko is virtuous, but she's also damaged. Now, Makari ends this film with a sense of rupture. The husband, Barkley, is sent off to California to live with yet another daughter. The California climate will supposedly be better for his failing health. And Lucy is left behind at the train station, alone and soon to move to an old age home. And we're left with the sense that if only those kids weren't so selfish, all of this wouldn't have happened. Not with Ozu. The adult children in Ozu's version are just as selfish. But the separation of the parents comes from Tomi's death. And so there's something more profound at work here. Because even morally perfect children can't stop their parents from dying. Ozu drives home this cycle of life and death by repeating at the end of Tokyo Story a scene from the beginning of the film. In the beginning, a neighbor walks past the window and says hello and makes small talk about the weather. Shukichi and Tomi are packing, so she asks about the upcoming trip to Tokyo. And then at the end, the same neighbor passes by in the same way and makes the same small talk about the weather. But now, the following pleasantries are about Shukichi being lonely. So there's a circularity to the film. Tomi has died, but life goes on. Small talk with the neighbors continues, and most of it's even the same small talk. Time flows onward, Death changes everything, but it also changes nothing. So this is a profoundly Buddhist perspective. Change is inevitable, including children growing up, children moving away, parents growing old, parents dying. In Buddhism, moral behavior is essential. If you are immoral, you will not be happy. But being good won't stop change, and it won't prevent loss. And if you think being a perfectly moral child will stop your parents from growing old and dying, then you are in for a really unhappy surprise. Now, Oza was once asked whether his films were Buddhist, and he gave an ironic answer. Western critics, he said, think my films are Buddhist, but that's only because they don't understand mujō. Now, mujō is a Buddhist term. It means impermanence. So there's something deeply ironic about Ozu using a Buddhist term to insist that his films are not Buddhist. And that theme of impermanence is central to Ozu's filmmaking. There's a sweet sadness to many of his films and a sense of acceptance we cannot stop change. Everything is impermanent, and everything will slip away. So for Ozu, grand moral gestures are less important than small moments of intimacy. Because all we ultimately have are those fleeting moments. Now, it's hard to find a greater contrast to Ozu than Kurosawa Akira. Also an internationally acclaimed director, but known for his action films on big sets with lots of swordplay and violence and motion. A very different style from Ozu's quiet domestic dramas. But like Ozu, Kurosawa was both a distinctively Japanese filmmaker and a cosmopolitan. And today I'd like to focus on that aspect of his work. In particular, we can trace it in his 1961 film, Yo Jimbo, starring one of Kurosawa's favorite actors, Mifune Toshiro. Now, some consider Yo Jimbo a minor work. Kurosawa's 1950 film, Rashomon, won the Golden Lion Award at the Venice Film Festival and an Academy Award. His 1954 film, The Seven Samurai, also with Mifune, 
was both internationally acclaimed and a financial success in Japan. And my favorite Kurosawa film, Ikiru, is also a favorite of many critics. So why do I choose Yojimbo, considered by many a minor film? Well, first, it's a great film. Small, perhaps, but great. In Japan, it was actually a bigger hit than The Seven Samurai. And The Seven Samurai had been a massive undertaking, a huge cast, years of filmmaking, way over budget. Yojimbo, by contrast, was a fairly quick, simple, and cheap film. But it was Kurosawa's most successful film to date. But what I find even more compelling is how Yojimbo fits our theme of Japan's global connectivity. It's clearly influenced by American film, but it also had an impact going in the other direction. It forever changed American film. Now, Kurosawa was a huge fan of American director John Ford, and he never hid this. He said John Ford's 1946 film, My Darling Clementine, was a model of what cinema should be. And Kurosawa was also a cosmopolitan reader. Several of his films are based on Shakespeare plays, some on Russian literature, and he also loved U.S. crime fiction, including Ed McBain and Dashiell Hammett. But he was also a Japanese filmmaker who loved Japanese history. And even when he adapted Shakespeare and Dostoevsky and American crime fiction, he set it in Japan. And all these influences come together brilliantly in Yojimbo, which is inspired by the film version of Dashiell Hammett's novel, The Glass Key, and also by Hammett's novel, Red Harvest. Moreover, the visual influence of John Ford is evident throughout the film. But it's also infused with an older Japanese tradition, the story of the Ronin, the masterless samurai. So the film is Kurosawa's fusion of detective fiction, the American Western, and the Japanese samurai tradition. And the effect is something distinctive and remarkable. It's one of the smartest action movies ever made. Now the story is secondary to the visuals and the acting, but here is the basic narrative of Yojimbo. In 1860, just before the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate, a nameless ronin, played by Mifune Toshiro, wanders into a small town, and he finds that the town is in the grip of a gang war between a fellow named Sebe and his former henchman, Ushitora. The war has divided the town, which is absolutely paralyzed by fear. The situation is so bad that one of the few good men in town, the innkeeper, tells the ronin that it would be better if both gang bosses were dead. That's just a tiny bit of foreshadowing by Kurosawa. At first, the Ronin is willing to sell his services to the gangster Sebe. But when he discovers that Sebe plans to stab him in the back, literally stab him in the back, after the big fight is over, the Ronin decides to have some dark fun and to get the two gangs to kill each other. Now, both gangs are so horrible, so devoid of any redeeming qualities, that as an audience, we're just waiting for them all to be killed. And we're cheering on the Ronin as he sets them against each other. But the Ronin, despite his gruff exterior, he has a buried moral compass. And he learns that one gang has kidnapped a farmer's wife partly for a gambling debt, but partly to give her as a mistress to one of their supporters. Now the Ronin won't stand for this. He frees the woman, killing all the guards, and thereby further inflaming the gang war. But he's tripped up, he's exposed, and he's exposed by a thank you note from the farmer's wife. Now the hero the Ronin is beaten up and he's tortured, but he escapes with the help of the good innkeeper. But then the innkeeper is kidnapped while he's in town to get medicine for the Ronin. 
So the Ronin goes back into town, and as you might guess, it's time to kill everybody. It's a spectacular action scene, including Mifune fighting a gangster armed with a pistol. And of course, the Ronin wins, all the bad guys are killed. Now visually, what's striking about Yojimbo is that it's a western. The scene where Mifune Toshiro faces off against the bad guys are lifted from John Ford westerns. Kurosawa shows us wide, empty streets, dust blowing. The good guy and the bad guy walk towards each other from opposite sides of town. It's a western except that the buildings are from 1800s Japan. And this is not something you see in other Japanese samurai films. But unlike a John Ford Western, there's a dark comedy to the film. Ronin is the hero, but he's nameless and he's dirty. He's unshaven, he's unkempt. He keeps scratching himself as if he has fleas. And for much of the film, he's just trying to get the two gangs to kill each other, which is not very noble. And Mifune is taciturn, but in a strangely cryptic, almost smirking fashion. He doesn't glower, directly intimidating his rivals. He's somehow removed. Maybe he's above the enemy, maybe he's below them, but he's on a different plane. He's viewing everything with ironic detachment. Mifune's final lines in the film are, well, it'll be quiet in this town now. And then with one stroke, he frees the bound innkeeper. And then he says, see ya, and he walks out of town. The total effect is both heroic and strangely apocalyptic. The nameless dirty hero is leaving a town that's now peaceful because the main street is full of dead bodies. And the hero is moral, but he's also disturbingly dark. Well, that vision of a dark hero, Kurosawa's fusion of hard-boiled film noir detective, western gunslinger, and ronin, this changed movies forever. Kurosawa and Mifune quickly made a sequel the following year called Sanjuro. And then the Italian director, Sergio Leone, released a remake in 1964 called A Fistful of Dollars. It was the first of a famous trilogy starring Clint Eastwood. Now, American critics didn't quite know what to make of A Fistful of Dollars, but the New York Times film critic Bosley Crowther did presciently suggest that Clint Eastwood's character might be, quote, a new non-hero. Well, he was right beyond his wildest dreams. Clint Eastwood's remake of Mifune's darkly heroic anti-hero has become a staple of modern film. Think of Dirty Harry, brooding and ironically distant. That's Clint Eastwood only after A Fistful of Dollars. It's not the rowdy Clint Eastwood from the TV show Rawhide. Or take Mel Gibson's character in the Mad Max movies. He's clearly inspired by Yojimbo. There are strong plot similarities between Yojimbo and Mad Max 2. The anti-hero comes out of nowhere, he sets things right, and then he drifts off to nowhere. And both Gibson and Mifune even have matching battered right eyes. But these guys aren't romantic, like in the classic Western Shane. They're too dark, they're too damaged. Now as a cultural critic, I love finding these lines and layers of influence. But intellectual property lawyers, well, they approach things somewhat differently. Now the 1964 film, A Fistful of Dollars, was such an obvious remake of Yojimbo that Kurosawa sued. And Sergio Leone admitted that he was influenced by Kurosawa, but he insisted that he was also directly influenced by Dashiell Hammett and by John Ford. The case was settled out of court, reportedly for cash, 
and a percentage of the box office. Then in 1996, director Walter Hill remade Yojimbo again, this time with the title Last Man Standing and starring Bruce Willis. But this remake was legal. New Line Cinema had bought the rights from Kurosawa's estate. So they were fine. Or so they thought. Then they got a letter from United Artists, threatening legal action. Because they were using the plot from A Fistful of Dollars. Now, the New Line lawyers apparently ignored that letter. And apparently, the United Artists lawyers had enough of a sense of irony not to push the claim. But then, New Line got a letter from Grimaldi Productions. Who? Grimaldi Productions were the owners of the rights to Red Harvest, the Dashiell Hammett novel. And they had an interesting point. Last Man Standing was going to be set in the U.S. in the 1920s with two warring gangs. And by moving the movie back to the U.S. and to the 1920s, it was now more like Red Harvest than Yojimbo. So even though New Line and Walter Hill had started out with Kurosawa in mind, they had actually wound up closer to the original Dashiell Hammett than to Kurosawa. Now those intellectual property issues were settled quietly. But isn't that a remarkable measure of Kurosawa's global status? The classic Dashiell Hammett novel, The Maltese Falcon, became the movie The Maltese Falcon. And his novel The Thin Man became the movie The Thin Man. But when his novel Red Harvest came back to the U.S. as a film, it was through Kurosawa. The American director and studio didn't even realize that they were re-importing Dashiell Hammett's story through Kurosawa. And that points to just how global a director Kurosawa was. Not only in what he read and what he watched, but in how he has been read and how he has been watched. Now Kurosawa has long been understood as an international filmmaker. In fact, some of his later big-budget films, like Kagemusha, were financed with support from his U.S. fans, like filmmaker George Lucas. And by contrast, Ozu is more commonly described as a quintessentially Japanese filmmaker. He died before he found international acclaim, and he never needed a big budget anyway. But as you watch more recent Japanese films, consider those tensions in Japanese film between speaking mostly to Japanese viewers about Japanese issues and making overtly cosmopolitan films, adapting foreign literature, and directing with a global audience in mind.